He said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Sometimes we just have to make up our mind and say, this is what I am going to do. I might not feel like it. I might think, well, you know, maybe this is not the place. I might not want to, per se, but when we make up our mind, and he goes on in verse 2, says, My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. And then he gives us an invitation. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. Now, you know, we think about David. Why, David was the praiser. David was the man after God's own heart. David, what, I mean, everything was right in his life, right? But if you look before this, I'm not sure Bible will, brings it out. It's not on the overhead that, that I know they don't have access. But it talks about this psalm was written when David was pursued by Saul. He was running for his life. And finally had gotten so tired of running for his life that he went into the Philistine nation and they brought him before Abimelech the king. Now, Abimelech, he's a sworn enemy. Abimelech has power to kill David right there. Abimelech looks and said, oh, is this the guy? That has, been, uh, that has been bothering us Philistines. Is this the guy that has been killing our people? But the Bible tells us that David changed his behavior. In other words, he acted like a madman. You know what he did? He started worshiping God. He started praising the Lord. You mean when I'm in a situation that I, I, things are really not looking like, what are people going to think about me? I don't care. I'm going to start praising God. How am I going to look stupid? Yeah, probably, but I'm going to start praising God. Is the people are going to think I'm crazy? Yeah, but I'm going to start praising God. And God moved in on that situation. And the king of Abimelech looked at him and said, you know, he's just a crazy guy. We're going to let him live. We're going to let him just go dwell in the land. And God was able to use David during that time to slay enemies of Israel, even though he wasn't the king yet. You see, it doesn't matter what we're going through. It doesn't matter the situation. It doesn't matter what people are going to think about us. What matters is we've come here to praise the Lord today. So I want to echo David when he said, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Would you lift up your hands and lift up your voice today? God, we give you praise. We give glory unto your name, Lord. God, you are high and holy above all others. There is none like you, Lord. There is none beside you, God. And God, I don't care how I look today. I don't care what people think today. I want to lift up your name. I want to give you praise. I want to give glory unto you, Lord. Come on, let's worship him together. Let's worship him with the singers as they sing and invite the presence of the Lord in this house today. We give you praise, God.
fade away across the great divide. Let behind heaven's throne to build it here inside. And there at the cross, you paid the debt I owe. Broke my chains, freed my soul for the first time. Thank you.
so glad in my everyday life I can call upon Jesus. So glad when I'm down and out I can call upon Jesus. So glad when I'm on the mountaintop I can call upon Jesus. No matter what situation, I'm so glad I know the name Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So glad I know him. So glad that one day I knelt at an altar as a young child and he gloriously filled me with the Holy Ghost. As a child of only eight years old, I said, Lord, I'm sorry for my sin. You said, how could you have sinned at eight years old? We are born into sin. Everybody is a sinner until you kneel into him and you say, Jesus, forgive me. I want to be ready one day, Lord. I'm sorry for all my sin, all of sin that comes short of the glory of God. And he gloriously, he says it's a gift. You shall receive a gift. How many likes to have a gift? Yes. Man, Christmas time is exciting. You know why? Because those kids see all those gifts under the tree and they're excited. They hardly sleep the night before. How many of you were like that when you were seeking the gift of the Holy Ghost? Were you just that excited? Lord, I want nothing else but the gift that you promised me, Lord. And that, you talking about the gift that keeps on giving. If you receive the Holy Ghost, it's something that gives each and every day of your life. Each and every second of your life. I am so happy and so thrilled to be filled with the gift that God promised me. How about you? Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated at this time. It is good to see each and every one of you here today. God bless you for coming to the house of the Lord. We're going to take our offering here in a little bit. But Brother Jody Reedus, it's good to see you, my brother. I know it's been tough on you. It's been a struggle to get here. But man, it is so good to see you. God bless Brother Jody Reedus. Brother, Sister Simmons, God bless you. We know that you've been through a lot. We've been praying for you. It's so good to see you folks here. My dear friend, Jamie Anderson, God bless you, man. It's so good to have you with us. I love you, Jamie. I believe God's got great things in store for you, son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I believe that in Jesus' name. John, good to see you with us today. God bless you. Each and every one. I know I'll leave out names. It's good to have each and every one of you. I'm going to uh, make some announcements and then we'll do, our, we'll do our offering. There is a hyphen lunch today after service. If you have any questions, see Sister Renee. Brother, I'm sorry. Oh, she's over here. Uh, Sister Renee or Brother Matt after service, you have any questions on that? This Thursday night, summer night, 7 p.m., each and every one that's here, we want you there on Thursday night also. God bless you for that. And then this Saturday, from 3 to 4.30, Hispanic Friends Group, this Saturday, and I've been told it's the one-year anniversary, sir, uh, right? Yes, Brother Bowski's giving me a thumbs up. Where did one year go? That flew by. But if you have any questions on a Hispanic uh, Friends Group this Saturday, see Brother Bowski after service. And at this time, we're going to give a chance for each and every one to be a blessing, not only to First Apostolic Church, but you are, will be blessed if you come up and just put whatever you can in our offering. May God richly bless each and every one of you in Jesus' name.
victory all the time. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
Jesus. We don't hear it as much anymore, but back in the day, preachers and song leaders would get up and say, God is good, and the church would respond. And all the time, God is good. Amen, amen, amen. We believe that tonight, today. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Singing in churches is so necessary because it is through our songs that we not only express feeling, but we also state truths. Amen. Every song that has been sung today has, in one way or another, declared what we have learned to be true about God, about His Word, about His promises for us. Amen. And so singing in a church is different than anywhere else. You can turn your radio on, radio on and you will hear songs that are not based upon truth at all. They're stories, fables, just the feelings of the writer. And they may move you emotionally, but singing in the house of the Lord also causes us to connect with the truth of God, the truth of His Word. And that's why you need to hear yourself sing these words as well. Don't just read them off the screen, but speak the words yourselves. Declare the words. Amen. Somebody's going to go out of here and face something today, tomorrow, this week, and you're going to start humming or you're going to start declaring, you are good all the time, all the time. You are good. Amen. Because you got it implanted in your heart. Amen. Through the worship. Hallelujah. Why do we pull out a hymn during our offering time. Amen. Not only does that connect us to our past, but it also helps teach the Word of God because often the hymns are full of doctrinal truths as well. And uh, so every which way that we can, whether it's through the preaching of the Word of the Lord as we are about to commence with or through the singing of the Word of the Lord through song, we want the Word of the Lord to be prominent in our midst Amen. you aren't prominent I'm not prominent the word of the Lord is prominent in our midst today amen 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 shake hands with two or three around you introduce yourself if you're sitting nearby somebody that you have not yet met God bless all of our guests that are with us today and those that have already been mentioned praise the Lord hallelujah God is good all the time and all the time he is good Thank you, Jesus. As you remain standing, I direct you into the word of the Lord today. To the Old Testament book of Jeremiah. While you're turning there, I want to say we heard good things about Thursday nights, summer nights. Thank you, Hyphen Ministry, for putting that together. And we look forward to family ministry leading summer nights this Thursday. We had a great great camp meeting. The Lord met with us in a marvelous way Monday through Friday night and uh, the word of the Lord went forth with great power and uh, anointing and uh, I understand that um, there were many individuals uh, especially children they had at this particular camp uh, evangelistic services for children every day and night and there were Dozens of children filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And that was a thrilling thing to hear. There were testified miracles uh, that happened in our services at the camp. And uh, just encouragement all around. I do want to make a statement here that uh, VBS is coming up in August. And uh, registration is ongoing now. And uh, your children and grandchildren need to be a part of First Apostolic Church's Vacation Bible School. It is going to be a tremendous year. I believe the Lord is in it, directing it. And uh, during the Tuesday and Wednesday sessions, we will be having evangelist Ethan Tucker with us. We're excited every time Brother Ethan Tucker comes to First Apostolic Church. And, uh, but he'll be with us as well. So 
you have children or grandchildren or neighborhood children that you know could greatly benefit from Vacation Bible School, please, please be mindful of the dates coming quickly. Jeremiah, the 32nd chapter, beginning with the 16th verse. Now, when I had delivered the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, I prayed unto the Lord, saying, Ah, Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Nothing too hard. Think of all of the things that are too hard for you. And there is nothing too hard for thee. Verse 26. Then came the word of the Lord unto Jeremiah. So verse 16 and 17 is Jeremiah talking to the Lord. And then verse 26 and 27 is the Lord talking to Jeremiah. Saying, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? Jeremiah, are you in agreement with what you said earlier? You need to be because great things are ahead. And I believe today great things are ahead for each and every one of us. And it is important for us to realize there is nothing too hard for the Lord. You may be going through something hard today, but it's not too hard for the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your mighty blessings. We thank you for the privilege that we have of walking with you who never leaves us when times get hard. You never forsake us when we go through difficulty and seasons of difficulty. We thank you, Lord, that you have proven yourself to be present at all times. Hallelujah. And that's why we bless you at all times. Because you're present with us at all times. There's not a time you're not with us. And we thank you for that today. Praise God. In Jesus' name, the Lord bless you. You may be seated. During the context of our scriptural passage that we read today, Jerusalem was besieged on every side by the Babylonians. It was just a matter of time until the Babylonians would break through the defensive measures that had been placed, the walls that were majestic. They would take everyone captive and they would burn the city down. God had already declared that this was his will that this was going to happen. Even before the Babylonian soldiers showed up with their gleaming shields and glistening swords, even before the people began to feel the pain of this besiegement, God had decreed it to be so through the prophet Jeremiah. I'm thankful today that the word of God doesn't come after the fact, but that the word of God is given to us and we can prepare before. God warns us prior. God gives us direction before we need to make a decision. The word of God was not heeded, however, because... The people felt secure. Jerusalem had withstood many attacks previously. The walls were high. The gates were strong. The army was powerful. But yet they had had to watch throughout the years as the Babylonians had come first for the northern tribes And had carried them away and now the last, the tribe of Judah, remained with their capital, this city called Jerusalem. 
But while this was all taking place, God instructs Jeremiah to do something that does not make much sense. A very peculiar thing is requested of Jeremiah, commanded rather of Jeremiah, that while they were starving, while they were awaiting to hear the Babylonian cry of war as they would come rushing into the city, God had Jeremiah go and talk to his cousin, a man, a man by the name of Hanamiel, and purchase the field that he owned. That Jeremiah was to get 17 shekels of silver, which was a lot of money and silver's value was not only recognized in Israel but would also be of some value if he was able to sneak it in to Babylon. Silver's appreciated in both nations. That's a lot of silver to pay for a field that Jeremiah is not going to be able to utilize for many years. In fact, if you are a student of Scripture, you know exactly how many years that these captives were going to be held in Babylon. Seventy years. And so Jeremiah does what everyone thinks to be a very ridiculous thing, and that is he calls for Hanamiel and he takes these 17 shekels of silver and together they go to the court and legally in the sight of witnesses and the judge write up all of the proper documentation that is necessary. The money is exchanged and all of that documentation is put into clay pitchers or what the Bible refers to as earthen vessels and it is buried in a place that would be protected from the Babylonians. Often we refer to it as Jeremiah's grotto accessible only to those that would know the intricate pathways of tunnels that lead down to this grotto or this storage place. Interestingly, some have said that Jeremiah's grotto was underneath what would later be known as Calvary, Mount Calvary. That's for us to learn later as we hear from the Lord, but it's a very interesting idea. And so the purchase is made, the money is exchanged, the documents are buried in these earthen vessels, and the deal is set. But Jeremiah cannot take possession of this because right around that particular time, Babylonians break through and they come in and they begin to carry off all that was of value and the people and then they burn the city down according to the word of the Lord. But prior to Jeremiah being taken from the place, I believe, Sister Cox, if you would help me with that, stick there that's in front of you. Jeremiah did something that was necessary for himself more than for anyone else. That is, he went out and he got 
a stake. And he went to the field of Hanamiel. And he took a hammer. And he began to stake his claim upon that field. The documents were in place, but there needed to be a visible reminder for everyone that would come upon the field that was formerly known as Hannah Mills. Now we know, as I mentioned, that Jeremiah had understood from the word of the Lord that this particular time of, of, of persecution and uh, uh, trouble would only last 70 years and that afterward, whenever God's word of the people returning to Israel would come to fruition, there would not be any question when the people came back upon the land, who is the rightful owner of this particular field? I've come today with a simple message. I've come today to tell us that it is important for us to stake our claims. The word or expression putting a stake on a claim comes primarily from the mid-1800s. Some say it dates back to the California gold rush when people came from all over North America to seek for gold that had been discovered there. And they quickly would need to set up boundaries. This is my land. That is your land. I'm going to be digging and mining in this particular area. And so they would make their purchases in hopes of discovering gold uh, in abundance. And then they would go around the perimeters of their field and they would drive stakes with their name and, and any necessary documentation into the ground so that new arriving individuals would not take up residence there, but they would realize, okay, this land has been set apart. This is somebody else's. This belongs to so-and-so. They are working this particular land. And I believe today from these two texts of scriptures that we have read that we can drive stakes into two particular promises of God. That if you and I are going to stand in the last days, if we are going to hold on to the promises of God when all of hell is trying to besiege us, when it seems like defeat is all that we are going to experience, it's very important for us to drive a stake in the ground. It's very important for us to make a claim that even the devil himself cannot uproot. And it's very important that we do this legally. You can't just drive a stake in any old piece of land. If I would show up at your house and I would put some kind of a sign on your property that says my name and that I'm the owner of that, People would look at you and say, what are you going to do about that? The crazy pastor's trying to take over your land. Well, you all you would have to do is say, let's, let's go down and see what the deed says. Let's go and see what's written on the title. Let's look at how this has been properly stored. Because there's documentation that has been made that proves who the rightful owner is. And Jeremiah, while others mocked him, obeyed the command of God and purchased the field of Hanum based upon I believe uh, this very promise first of all from Jeremiah chapter 32 and verse uh, uh, number 17 uh, where Jeremiah said oh Lord God behold thou hast made the heaven and the earth uh, by thy great power and stretched out 
arm and there is nothing too hard for thee. Oh, hallelujah. Jeremiah, you're wasting 17 shekels of silver. You may need that in the future just to buy food or, or barter for clothing. Why would you be buying land that Israel will never own again? Oh, Jeremiah would be able by faith in the word of God to say, I have a promise. I have been told that one of these days land and houses are going to be bought and sold in Israel again. That we may seem to be knocked down today. It may look like destruction is going to forever wipe us off the map but I'm placing my stake in the word of God that says I serve a God that nothing is too hard for the Lord that nothing is too difficult is another rendering of that nothing is too difficult for thee now, difficulty, we're all familiar with difficulties. We have faced difficulties in our life. You're probably going through some sort of difficulty even as you sit here today. A difficulty would be defined as something that is hard to accomplish. It's something that you're having to deal with but you can't quite get it right. Or it's something that you cannot understand. You're facing an obstacle and you're trying to wrap your mind around it. You're trying to see now what do I do from this point on. It's difficult. It's troublesome. It's burdensome. I look at myself and I don't see enough. I don't think I've got the strength to go any further. I don't think I can do this by myself. But then at that moment is when I grab a hold of a stake and I plant it in my life. A stake that reminds me I serve the Lord that made the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah said this world was here before I was and it's going to be here after I leave it. It was brought into pass by the word of God and if God can speak a word and create the sun and the moon and the stars if God through his word can make dry land appear if God through his word can create everything I don't know amen if other people are going to understand me or not but I'm staking my claim in the word of God and I'm going to believe that he's going to bring it to pass that he's going to make a way where there seems to be no way that he's got a plan I can't trace it I can't understand it all I see is difficulty but I'm staking my claim oh Lord God thou that have made the heavens and the earth by thy great power nothing is too hard for thee I've come with a simple message today. This, you're not going to have to wait for me to get to my point. I'm going to make the same point two different ways. I'm preaching the devil out of somebody now. I'm preaching fear out of somebody now. I've come to preach discouragement out of somebody now. I've come to preach hope into somebody now. I've come to declare peace over somebody now. And that's all based upon a stake that's in the word of God. Nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Oh, let's clap our hands unto him and give him praise. Come on, clap your hands and speak to the difficulty and say, difficulty, hear the word of the Lord. Difficulty, hear the word of the Lord. I serve a God with whom nothing is too hard. He can speak the word and the winds appear. He can speak a word and the stars appear. He can speak a word. And it all comes back the way it was. Sometimes God has to just recreate what he's already created. Sister Cox was telling me about what Sister Carla Burton spoke at the ladies service at the camp meeting and she preached a word I wasn't there because they don't let men at the ladies service 
But it sounds like it might have been the best message of the whole conference. And I didn't even get to hear it. And I don't think they even recorded it. But she got up there, Sister Cox, and she began to speak about how God created everything, right? He spoke creation into being. He declared it and it was so. He called things that were not and they became. He made things that never had before existed. He did not work off a blueprint from another God's plan. Amen. Everything that was brought to pass was brought to pass out of the word of God, the logos of God, the imagination of God. Amen. Divine perfection instituted all things and it was all made by him and for him, the Bible says. That without him was not anything made that, that was made. And so God made everything for himself, by himself, and, and, and said of it, it is good. But then sin got into this thing. And sin begins to mess up with things. And sin begins to distort things. And trouble is, interest, is introduced and difficulty comes into creation. And we are left to deal with the difficulties of sin. We're left to deal with weakness now. We weren't born to die, but because of the disobedience in the garden, death spread to all mankind. Brother Randy Wellman said it already. We were born in sin. We were shaping in iniquity. We came into this world ready to die. And if we don't get right with God, we're going to die lost, separated forever from God. God and so sin brought the difficulty and sin brought the destruction and sin brings suffering and pain and sorrow but oh sister Burton said that she has begun to read in scripture and begin to see that the same God that created in perfection now can bring a, a new creation the Bible speaks about us being new creatures in Christ Jesus Jesus, old things are passed away. All things become new, literally to the point that wherever you might be facing difficulty, and she, be, she ended her message, I believe, Sister Cox, you shared it like this. She ended her message, amen, because of the time constraints. She said, listen, listen, some of you may have sickness in your body. Amen, your body wasn't created originally to be sick. Some of you may be dealing, amen, with cancers and you may be dealing with this uh, a malady or that malady but she reminded the ladies that we serve a God that created it once and he can create it again amen and she told stories about people that came to prayer meetings and were anointed with oil and had faith to believe God to heal their particular body their particular organ but went back to the doctor after prayer and the doctor's did an x-ray and they began to search around and they came back and they said it's as if you got a brand new heart it's as if you got a brand new liver it's as if this kidney is like a baby's kidney and she said what happens is that we serve a God that not only can create it once but he can recreate it and so speak to your sickness speak to the body speak and say I'm declaring I, it shall be recreated you say well pastor that seems so big pastor that seems uh, difficult for me to understand uh, you better believe it's difficult for you to understand but it's not difficult for me to understand when I know in whom I have believed and I know that nothing come on shout it at me nothing one more time nothing nothing it's too difficult for thee. Aha! Nothing is too difficult for my God. Oh, praise the Lord. He can recreate that which he has already once created. We stake our claim upon it. Jeremiah, you may be seated, staked his claim upon the creative power of God as he remembered the heavens and the earth. Jeremiah staked his claim upon the judicial power of God. I don't have time today to read those verses that follow verse number 17, but it begins to talk about recompense, and it begins to talk about how God is the judge of 
of all the earth and that God recompenses towards man. Oh, hallelujah. God is the judge of all the earth. Amen. He's going to deal righteously and judiciously. He's going to handle all things properly and in order. Oh, hallelujah. He's going to set right what the devil tried to mess up. That's the kind of God you can stake your claim on. It may seem like as I preach today, the devil's got the upper hand, but stake your claim upon the word of God that the judge of all the earth is going to defend you. Hallelujah. And he staked his claim finally upon the miraculous power of God as it was displayed in Egypt. Verse number 20. Jeremiah, it's a long time ago that we got out of Egypt. Jeremiah, you're, you're, you're really going to go back that far? I mean, it was a big deal, Jeremiah, whenever Moses let the children of Israel out of Egypt. That was a big deal, man. Even Egypt to this day, the Bible says, even to that day, Egypt had not fully recovered. Generation after generation after generation. In fact, history will tell you, and it's true, that the Egyptian nation never to this day has fully ever recovered. Some of you have been to Egypt and have told me about it. And you're saying, Pastor, everything in Egypt is just archaeology. It's all dusty. There's nothing. There's no vibrancy in Egypt. There's no life in Egypt. Their money mainly comes from tourists that come to see the past as it's been uncovered in the dust and watch the pyramids that still remain to this day. Egypt is a testimony of their glory days before they got in the way of God. <laughs> Amen. Egypt's story is a story that they tried to do away with the people of God and the plan of God. But God sent a deliverer and God, a man, kept his promise and his word. And so whenever Jeremiah was being mocked for buying his field with 17 shekels of silver right before the gates were going to be pushed down and Babylon soldiers were going to come through. Jeremiah was looking back, amen, to what he had only heard from his elders about a God that can deliver, a God that can set free. Oh, I've come to preach to somebody here today that may be in bondage. You may feel like you are wrapped up, tied up, and tangled all up in sin, but let me remind you there is a grace of God that is amazing, that his mercy is new every morning. I serve a God today that can deliver you out of the muck and the mire. I can preach to any sinner on the face of the earth because I know nothing is too high for the Lord. Hallelujah. I can't make him big enough. He's bigger than I can preach him. He's greater than I can eloquently describe him. His mercy can reach farther than I can even declare to you. He's a great God and he knows no impossibilities. Oh, hallelujah. That's the first claim that Jeremiah staked his claim upon. Oh, oh, I know, hallelujah. You made the heavens and the earth. That's a big deal. You have by your great power and stretched out arm did these things. That's a big deal. And even though I can't fathom myself how you're going to bring this back to me, I'm going to stake a claim. I'm going to put my roots down. I'm going to say this is mine, Babylon. You may have it for 70 years. Oh, hallelujah. The devil thought he had you for all your life. You may look back over a period of your life and say, devil, you had me for the first 20 years. Devil, you might have had me for a while when I was a young adult. Devil, you might have had me when I kind of slipped around, amen, and messed up. But devil, you don't have me today. You can't claim your, you can't stake any claim on me today. I've been bought by the blood of Jesus. I've been set free. Oh, hallelujah. And as I've been set free, the devil has no more right to me. Amen. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Oh, praise God. Second claim Jeremiah makes is found in verse number 27 of the second claim that he stakes his claim upon. The first time, it's Jeremiah kind of speaking to God. The second claim is God speaking to Jeremiah. And he says unto him, behold, stop and consider this. Quit 
trying just to testify about me to make yourself feel good. Sometimes that's what we do. You know, we don't really believe, but we try to talk ourselves into faith. You don't talk yourself into faith. Faith cometh by what? Hearing the what? Amen. You can't talk yourself into faith. You can talk yourself out of faith, but you can't talk yourself into faith. Behold, Jeremiah, I am the Lord. Anytime that designation I am is rendered in your scripture, you know that it testifies of the greatness of God's name. It testifies that his name is greater than any one designation. And so in the Old Testament, they had all these compound names of, of God. They would get a revelation and they would get so excited and they'd go tell everybody, oh, he provided for me and we're going to call him Jehovah Jireh, the Lord my provider. Oh, he gave me a real peace about this and peace in our land. Jehovah peace shalom. Oh, I'm, he's a Jehovah shalom. Oh, he's the healer of my body. Jehovah Rapha. He's the healer of my body. On and on and on. They made these compound names because they kept getting further revelation of who the I am was but when God wanted to tell Jeremiah he could believe him for not just what he has done but what he will do he reminded him of his name I am that I am or I will be what I've always been I just want to remind an apostolic here today that's been baptized in the name of Jesus that knows there's only one Lord one faith and one one baptism, one God and Father of all who's above all and through all and in you all. I want to remind you who Jesus is. I want to remind you that Jesus is Jehovah Jireh. Jesus is Jehovah Nisi. Jesus is Jehovah Shalom. Jesus is Jehovah Tisid Canoe. Jesus is Jehovah Rapha. Jesus is, Jesus is, Jesus is all of that. He is all in all. He is all in all. And his name's above every name. Oh, praise God. His name's above every name. I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. The God of all flesh. All right, so Jeremiah, I don't want you just to walk around with your eyes I don't want you just to look around with your, your eyes heavenward thinking about the sun. For the next 70 years, you're not going to have to look at the sun in the daytime and the moon in the nighttime and say, well, the God that made that, he's going to get me my money back or something. The God that made the heavens and the earth, the God that made all the, and the God that did that in Egypt, all those things that have already been done, he's, he's the same God. He's going to be able to do it. But Jeremiah, I want you to understand not only am I the God that made the heavens and the earth by my great power and stretched out arm, but I'm going to tell you directly, I am the God of all flesh. Sometimes we start magnifying flesh. Sometimes we get to the point where we think what man can do and what man is doing is so great that God is somehow limited that somehow they're handcuffing God. That, that the will of man is so great that it's somehow setting aside the will of God. The will of flesh was seen in the Babylonians conquering the world and just as it had been predicted they were going to have their day <laughs> they were going to have their time they were going to be there for a while and do some things and they were going to be feared and it was going to make the earth tremble but just like they came so should they go they were here today but gone tomorrow. And sometimes while we know in whom we have believed because we've read the scripture and while we look up into the heavenlies and we declare that we, we, we hear echoing from the skies the declaration that our God creator is able to take care of us. And while we sing songs that magnify him, we 
walk out the door of the church and we go back to deal with people. And we think that somehow people have become so powerful. And so what God tells Jeremiah here is, I'm the God of all flesh. I'm the God that is able to deal with the Babylonians. I'm the God that has given them their window of opportunity here. In fact, the only reason why the Babylonians were able to take over the land of Israel for 70 years was because of Israel not obeying the commandment of the Lord to give the land its Sabbath rests. And they had missed the Sabbath rests. Seventy times they had missed it. And so God said, listen, I'm going to give the land its rest for 70 years. I'm going to, I'm going to be, uh, amen, I'm going to keep my word of promise to the land even if the people aren't going to appreciate it. Uh, they're not understanding my promise and my covenant that I have made with the land. So I'm going to get them off the land. Uh, amen. That was the only reason why Babylonians were able to come against uh, the people people of God. Oh, hallelujah. I've come to declare to you and I today uh, that Satan is trying uh, to stake a claim upon us, uh, but you and I need to remind the devil uh, we're bought by the blood of Jesus. Uh, we're new creatures in Christ. Uh, oh, hallelujah. We've been to an altar. Uh, we've been to a fountain, uh, and we have been filled with his spirit, uh, and we don't belong to him. And so you may be able to put a face and a name to what problem, your problem is. You may be able to say, Pastor, my difficulty is with him and or her. My difficulty is with them and those. I, I, I'm dealing with the, the people here. It's, a, it's an issue that I have with my family. It's an issue that I have with my neighbors. And, and, and I just don't know how, how this is going to work out in my favor. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. I remind you today to stake your claim that there is nothing too hard for the Lord. Lord. God rules over all people. God governs every nation. He raises up kingdoms and he tears them down. Isaiah said the government is upon his shoulder. You and I may look around us and we may not like what we see that man is doing, but man can't do anything that is going to somehow mess up the timing of God, the plan of God. He cannot thwart, amen, the will of God. God, let God be true in every man a liar. God doesn't just work in the heavenlies. He also a work. He also works amongst men. And men are never an obstacle to God. Men are never an obstacle to God. You say, well, yeah, I mean. We got our will and we can do what we want. Yes, you do have a will and there may be temporary times where it seems as if you have paused something that God wanted to bring into your life. But I remind you, he's sovereign. God will be a debtor to no man and God is going to reconcile the books when it's all said and done. And every I is going to be dotted and every T is going to be crossed. Because this story isn't my story. It's his story. And I'm staking a claim in his story. I'm staking a claim that he's going to wrap this thing up. I'm staking a claim that God has got a plan that I can't understand. It's bigger than me. It's bigger than you. But I'm just resting in that. God, I'm just putting my stake there in that. That in the end, you're going to win. In the end you're going to wrap it all up victory victory shall be mine if I hold my peace and let the Lord fight my battle victory victory shall be mine rejoice not against me O mine enemy for if I fall I shall arise get behind me Satan I am more than a conqueror through him that loved me greater is he in me than he that is in the world we need some people like David that'll look up at Goliath and stake a claim and said the God that delivered me from the hand of the lion and the paw of the bear can deliver me from this Philistine. Oh, hallelujah. Stake your claim. Stake your claim. Is there anything too hard for me? 
So here's how we end this. God asked Jeremiah the question. God asks us the question today as well. Listen to it again. God asks you, is there anything too hard for me? Well, I can tell you it's too hard for me, God. I can tell you all my difficulties that I'm going through. I can tell you about bills I've got to pay. I don't have the money. I, I can tell you about sicknesses that in my body that there's no cure for. I can tell you, God, there's a lot of things on this earthly plane, in this realm of reality that we get sucked into so often and our senses become prisons to our understanding of God that can only be understood by faith. And our faith is imprisoned by our senses to the extent that we begin to question if maybe there's a problem he can't meet or solve. So there have been some people in the past, unfortunately, that went around the perimeters of their life and they started pulling up stakes. They pulled up the stakes that they had once planted in faith. I'm telling somebody here today, I'm done, but the Holy Ghost isn't. I'm telling somebody here today that the stakes you planted in faith, don't touch them. Don't move them. Don't let the devil tempt you to pull them up. Because this thing's about to wrap up. Your difficulty's about to disappear. There's a solution coming to your question. There's a, hey man, there's a fix coming. And when you get on the other side, you're going to look around and say, God gave me ground. God gave me good ground. He had me buy it before the devil even begun to get his victory in my life. But I planted some stakes before I went through discouragement. I planted some stakes before I went through difficulty. I planted some stakes before I developed that disease. I planted some stakes before I ever encountered that kind of difficulty. And oh, hallelujah, that stakes, those stakes remind me of good ground. Those stakes remind me of blessed places. Those stakes remind me of gifts of God. Those stakes remind me a promised land. Oh, hallelujah. Amen. Jeremiah had a stake in the promised land of God. And some of you have been tempted to pull your stakes up. But I declare to you today, nothing is too hard for the Lord. Keep your stake in the promise of God. Keep your stake in the word of God. Oh, let's all clap our hands to the Lord. These altars are open today. Somebody needs to come down here and answer the question that God has asked us. God asked, is there anything too hard for me? What, what, what is on your list today of problems? What's on your list today? Amen. There's a whole lot of things on your list, but I ask you as you review your list in prayer, is there anything too hard for God? Nope. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? Nope. Is this too hard for the Lord? Nope. Is this too hard for the Lord? No way. Is this too hard for the Lord? I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know what he's going to do, but I serve a God that I put a stake in. He can do all things. Nothing is too difficult. Nothing is too difficult to God. He can move mountains. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. He can call the dead back to life. He can heal. He can deliver. He can say nothing, nothing, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Come on, somebody. That's what your faith woke you up this morning to get you to the house of God to hear. That's why the Holy Spirit impressed upon you to come to church today. Every difficulty in your life tried to keep you from this message, but I've come to preach, amen, what the Word has woke me up to say today. And somebody's going to go home changed with a, another perspective altogether on your difficulty. Difficulties only reveal the power of God. A great difficulty will teach you how great God is.
Jesus. When you get on the other side of that battle, when you come forth as pure gold, <laughs> when you get victory, you're going to realize, oh, nothing, nothing, nothing is too difficult. Nothing, nothing, nothing is too difficult for the Lord. Oh, come on. not be shaken. Come on, somebody. We will not be moved.
if there's somebody here that you know you put a fresh stake in the ground today. You put a fresh stake in the ground. If you're not going to let anybody, you're not going to let any devil pull it up. You're going to just claim your promise. Somebody who who would say you did that today. Come to this. Come to this pulpit. I put a fresh stake. Brother Welvin put a fresh stake in the ground. Won't you walk it around the building? And then if you believe that you put a fresh stake in the ground, grab it. He's going to pass it off to you when it gets up here. As you walk, shake Declare it, declare it in Jesus' name. Shake off despair as I speak out your name. A victory dance, I will dance now in faith. Christ is upon my 
hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, 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 amen. All right, for her husband. Amen, hallelujah. Pray for her. Some of our sisters gather around her. Some of our men gather around her. She's praying for a husband that knows the way back. In the name of Jesus. We need some more wives that will get a burden for their husbands. Need some husbands that will get a burden for their wives. We need some dads and moms that will get a burden for your unsaved children. Amen. You see this right here. We need more of this right here in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes. Oh, hallelujah. All things are possible. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. A few years ago, I was driving down the road there in northwest Indiana. Big old huge field. They'd had corn planted, and I noticed that there were some survey crews out there. They were looking through their little survey equipment they had flags posted at various places and they were able to read the land elevation the rise the fall of the land scoping out this place didn't know what they were planning to do there but they were the first ones they were the first ones that came the survey crew then after they had staked all the flags and they had everything marked off a few weeks later then the bulldozers showed up brother Jeff and they began to scrape the topsoil and they began to move dirt around and begin to dig deep in certain areas and and uh, just kind of leveling things and then when they were done it wasn't but a few weeks later that then different concrete people showed up and different utility groups showed up they began to run sewer lines and electric lines and plumbing lines. You drive by there today and there's a booming subdivision where there had just been previously a cornfield. You know what the Bible does for us is it, it helps us survey things. Before they ever become a reality, we begin to see through the Word of God by faith what's possible. And whenever God shows you something in His Word that reveals to you something about Him you didn't know before or quickens your faith to believe Him to do something great in your life, that's where you need to take a stake and mark it and say, you know what, I just saw that in Scripture. Instead of just, you know, telling other people about it, I'm going to believe it for myself. Amen, amen. The Bible's not full of anecdotes. The Bible's not full of cliches. The Bible's not just some kind of little book of idioms and nice statements. The Bible is truth. Yes. And when we can sometimes turn it into little encouraging, you know, anecdotes to help us get through the day, right. it might make you, you know, smirk and smile and 
you know, have a momentary uplift, but those things are meant for more than that. It's meant to help us get implanted deeper into the things of God. It's more than just something to tweet out and put on Facebook. It's for you to build your life upon. Whenever that's established in your life, he'll give you another and another and another and another and another. Amen. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother Andrew Gannon, Sister Jillian Gannon, welcome back. Amen. I want Brother Gannon to come if he would and dismiss us today in prayer. Amen. Don't we love this young couple? thankful for what the Lord has done in their life. Amen. Thrilled that amen, the Lord sent them here for this time and this season. Would you pray a blessing over, not just the young people, but pray a blessing over all of us in dismissal. Again, all of our guests, God bless you. What a day. What a glorious day. Lord Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for the service and the message our pastor preached that nothing is too hard for you, Lord. Help us to have blessings upon us as we go through this week, the youth group, the youth, and then also the people we had, the visitors we had. Thank you for that wonderful message. Help us to take it through this week, today, that wonderful move we had. Lord, help us to take that beyond just today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.